want to welcome you to uh, the Greater Boston Food Bank and to this first form of this kind. We haven't done this before, so we thank you for uh, being a part of this today. We hope to do a little more. So we, of course, went to two people we know pretty well. Um, and uh, our guests, which are known to you probably very well, um, Ellen Teller from FRAC and Dr. Greg Gunderson as well. So some of you know each of them and some of you know both of them and maybe a few of them, few of you don't know them at all. So you'll get to know them here. So uh, Dr. Gunderson is the Soybean Industry Endowed Professors in Agriculture Strategy at the University of Illinois. That's a long one. <laughs> but we, uh, we know him as the national expert in food assistance programs and the lead researcher uh, on Feeding America is what we call MAP the Meal Gap. And this project uh, is actually a study, you have a new study coming or another one that's going to be released uh, next month. Ellen Teller, Director of Government Affairs for the Food Research and Action Center based in Washington. Ellen and I were trying to figure out when we first met each other, so it's well over 30 years ago. Long time. Kids were little, now kids are big, <laughs> so you, you measure time in a particular way. Uh, but Ellen has been um, the Director of Government Affairs there, directing and developing and implementing FRAC's legislative agenda. And there's been a long history with Feeding America and FRAC over the years. And, um, and FRAC le has lent a lot of insight to help Feeding America sort of advance its role. Very different organizations, but in terms of just uh, legislatively, FRAC has always been that beacon. And so what we hope to do today is each of our speakers is going to spend some time with a presentation, um, and they'll, they'll do it separately, and then we have a big lot of time for q and It doesn't mean you can't ask something or a clarifying point. Uh, but we thought we would start uh, with uh, Dr. Gunderson. I see that as you are the, the top one. But these folks, you've worked together many times. <laughs> so this is not new for them. They've worked together in other presentations. But uh, we want to just thank you for coming, uh, for the advocacy that you do each and every day on behalf of those we serve across the Commonwealth and throughout New England. So I will leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's a, I wanted to thank the many people from Greater Boston Food Bank had contacted me, so I don't want to omit anybody. But really, it's a huge honor to be here, to be invited to be here for this presentation. Um, it's a, it's a, for those of you who don't know this, it's a very well-known food bank. I was giving a presentation to the Oregon Food Bank in January. I said, I'm going out to the Greater Boston Food Bank. She said, oh, they're doing amazing stuff there. So it's really great to see, to, to see this food bank. And it's always fantastic to be on a panel with Ellen. F for those of you who know, FRAC just does amazing stuff. Their advocacy work, both, you know, they hold everybody's, whether it be the Obama administration or the Trump administration, they hold their feet to the fire in terms of making sure that Americans escape food insecurity. So really appreciate all the work that all of you do. I also want to thank all of you for coming. There's lots of other neat things that you could be doing right now besides listening to us. So I really, really do appreciate you you being here today. So I'm going to structure, you know, it's too bad I have to talk about s threats to SNAP. What I wish I was talking about is opportunities for SNAP. In fact, we have this paper, colleagues of mine, on, that's coming out for Russell Sage Foundation, which talks about optimal ways to increase SNAP benefits and the impact of that, what that would be on food insecurity. I would much rather be talking about that here today rather than this issue of threats to SNAP. But I do think that there's some important threats that are emerging for SNAP that we need to be caught need to be cognizant of. But before turning to those is I want to give some background about really about how dire the food insecurity situation is in the United States and why it's so important we do something about it. And then I'm going to talk about what SNAP does. SNAP is an, an amazing program, a really, a truly amazing program. And I'm going to talk a bit about that before turning to unfortunately some people who unfortunately don't agree with me. Lots of people don't agree with me. But this is something where they should be agreed with me you know, on this particular topic. Okay. This is what's happened to food insecurity rates for both for the full population, which is in green below, and then orange on this. You've all seen things like this before. Okay. What I want to emphasize here is, is it's fantastic from 2014 that there's been this big decline from 2014 to 2015, and there was a slight decline before that amongst both groups. That's great news. However, is the thing we can't forget is A. Rates have not fallen back to the level they were in 2007, okay? 
the Great Recession's been over since 2009, and our rates of food insecurity are still higher than they were then. Okay? The second thing is, even during, even during good economic times, look at how many Americans are food insecure. Okay? So it's not that all of a sudden if we come into an era where people may be talking about rates declining, and that's great, but I don't think we should be talking about rates declining and then say, oh well, this is great, things are just going to get better and better. Let's hope they get better and better through the work of Greater Boston Food Bank and other groups, but let's not uh, overlook that. This is, by the way, this is just a picture of Massachusetts from Map the Meal Gap for all, uh, for children, the children measure the food insecurity. And I don't have much, you've all seen this before probably, I don't know how much to say to this. I mean, to, to Massachusetts credit is that you all have lower rates than other parts of the country even through this. Now, one thing I should note about this is that um, Boston also, the Greater Boston Food Bank also has information at the sub-county level that I don't have posted here. But then you'd see some parts of Boston which have really high rates of food insecurity that are masked by this, um, by some of this, by, uh, by looking at the county level. Okay. This gives you some notion about what's happening to food insecurity. This may be something you're, this is actually underlies math the meal gap, but let me talk a little bit about this, okay? Whenever we want to know something about how to improve the well-being of poor people or people who are struggling and vulnerable, it's one great way to do this is to ask them, what can be done to make your lives better? And one neat question that's on the current population survey and Hunger in America survey and other surveys is to ask people, how much more money would you need to be food secure? Okay? So you're asking people to actually know something rather than say, quote unquote, experts about how much more money they would need. And what this is, is this figure here gives us from 2002 up to 2014, what's happening in terms of the amount of money that people need to food. What you'll see is, there's been a steady increase over time in both the nominal, I, you know, just not, not inflation adjusted, and also the real amount over time. You know, what this shows then is that those who are food insecure are more food insecure are in, in greater need than they used to be. So even if the numbers of people who are food insecure are declining as we hope, we can't forget that those who are in some sense left behind in the food insecure ranks have really more and more need over time. Okay? So I want to emphasize this, why we need to be con concerned, continue to be concerned with issues regarding food insecurity. We also have to be co concentrated, interested in the health consequences associated with this. And you want to know something? All this work, much of this work that he, we have here was done by the wonderful Deborah Frank. She's been a pioneer in the area of uh, food insecurity research. Now, I'll, without, it's fantastic that you have her here in Boston because you also have some people here in Boston who do some bad stuff for SNAP and we can talk about some of those people if we want. But no, but so is that food insecurity is, a bit, she's brought more and more attention to this issue about the numerous health consequences associated with food insecurity. For all of us in Children's Health Watch and we only do pills. You guys, somebody else does the, the, the wrong. Uh, but never, yeah, yeah, it's a, a typical about being modest about her work. Okay, so at any rate is that, but, but I won't be modest about your work. See. <laughs> The other thing is, is that, so if somebody, I give these presentations all the time and I say, I think we should be concerned about the children are going to bed hungry, the seniors don't know where their next meal comes. But I've given these presentations to a lot of groups and people are like, you know, a, an empty stomach is a great motivator. I'm like, yeah, that's why, because you never had an empty stomach that you couldn't fill up. But at any rate, is that when people say that, it's but even if somebody says that's food insecurity per se is fine, which of course we don't agree with, it's there's these health consequences associated with it. And maybe if you don't even care about the health consequences, we have to be concerned about the really high health care costs. From the study that we did in Canada with Val, with Val Tarasek, is what we found was that in comparison to fully food secure households, is very low food security households have 121% higher health care costs. Okay? People in the United States are always talking about obesity. Obesity. Let's talk about food insecurity as a health care crisis in our country. Okay? One of the best ways to address this health care crisis brought about by is, is through the form of medicine, namely SNAP. And I know Deborah's been used this term before and other groups, FRAC has used this. SNAP is a form of medicine. It's a very important form of medicine. It would help us drive down health care costs. So I want to give, a, everybody here knows about SNAP, but I want to give what I emphasize when I talk about SNAP to other groups. So, you know, so for example, I give a lot of presentations, given my soybean stuff, to farmers. So I talk a lot about SNAP with, with, with farmers and with other groups. So this is what I talk about. 
The primary goal of SNAP is to alleviate hunger. 50 years ago when the SNAP began, is we had serious problems with malnutrition, stunting, wasting, all these serious problems. We still have serious problems in the United States, but they're a lot, not as bad as otherwise would be because SNAP. The reason I emphasize this is over time, people have talked about SNAP doing other stuff. Okay, this SNAP should do this. Why isn't it doing that? Why isn't it doing that? Fine, ask it to do other things, but let us never ever forget that any policies that we propose for SNAP, if they impede its ability to alleviate hunger, we should be speaking out against those. Okay? That's the main goal of SNAP, and we shouldn't forget that. I give presentations overseas a lot on this stuff, and people always talk about the United States being, oh, you have all these problems. And yes, we have problems in the United States. But you know, I'm proud that we have SNAP. Okay? SNAP is one of the things that makes America great. Okay? We really are, I mean, this is a generous program in terms of benefit levels. Of course, it could be more generous, and again, that's what I, with what I wish I was talking about today. Actually, that's wrong. It should be 642. But the maximum benefit level is um, you know, $642 for a family of four, and the average benefit level is about $300 for a family of four. Okay? This should be higher, but it's not small. We're trying to give people... The second is, is that... Right, it's per month, Dr. Pitt. That's a per right, month. I'm sorry, that's per month. Yeah, if this was per year, I'd say <laughs> that's not so good. Yeah. This is per month. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I should be clearer. Um, I think it serves... Oh, it's, 40, it's, 40, it's 42 million now? What is it now? 42? Is it 45? 42. 42, okay, sorry. So, <laughs> so it's 42. Anyway, and the total cost is about $80 billion a year. It's going okay. down. It's going down, which is, again, good news insofar as... Less people need it. It's bad news, though, if those who aren't getting on it are, get, are leaving it for other reasons. Okay, so this gives you some information about this. This is the main thing. Some government programs work well. Some government programs don't work quite as well. SNAP works amazingly, okay? We set out a goal for, not we, but the other people set out the goal for SNAP to alleviate food insecurity, okay? That's the goal. What did they find? They found the SNAP recipients in comparison to eligible non-recipients, are 20% less likely to be food insecure. I really don't think we can find another government program that succeeds as a, in the w profound way that SNAP does in our society. Okay? We should be talking about this all the time. Whenever people, whenever people criticize SNAP, we should always be saying, yeah, fine. But look at this figure here. Now, the other thing that I talk about, talk about these groups, is to talk a little bit about why I think there's threats to SNAP. I think people don't understand this program. People may not know this, but they also may have all these kind of weird ideas about it. And there was this recent report that came out from Congress talking about how SNAP leads to reductions in either hours worked or earnings or labor supply. That's not true, okay? SNAP does not lead to reductions in labor supply. Other government programs in, have, are oftentimes poorly designed insofar as they have these quote unquote cliff effects, where if you make $1 more, you lose all your benefits, okay? We need to change around the way that those are structured. SNAP is not that way though, is as you earn more and more dollars, is your benefit levels fall, but not one for one, okay? So if you wanna make more money, is you could do that and you could still get SNAP benefits. In fact, if people say that SNAP reduces it, currently the, ta the effective tax on SNAP benefits is 24 cents per dollar, okay? We can reduce that even further if we want to encourage it more. But SNAP does not reduce labor supply. So when people talk... Sorry, I missed the 24 cents on the dollar. What, was that? what is that? For every additional dollar that I earn, I lose 24 cents in SNAP benefits, okay? Okay, and so given that we're talking about reductions in taxes for other groups, I actually would be happy if we started talking about reductions in taxes for SNAP recipients, such that for each additional dollar you earn, you only lose you know, 15 cents or something, but that, that, that's just it. But whenever people talk about it discouraging people's work effort and stuff, that's not true. The other thing is, is I get this all the time. So I did this interview with, uh, with uh, Washington Post, okay? And so it's actually kind of funny. So they, the person, Caitlin Dewey, interviewed me, and then I had this whole interview talking about how all these mis misimpressions of, of SNAP about fraud, okay? And then you get down to the comments underneath it, and people are telling these stories again about these fraud that they've all seen and then making these generalizations. So it was kind of, kind of funny. But anyway, here is the first thing, is people think that 
There's a lot of people going up and redeeming their SNAP benefits for cash at the cashier level. That re almost all SNAP benefits are, at, you know, large scale food retailers. I mean, Walmart is not going to, you know, we're running the scam. That's not going to happen at Walmart or these large scale supermarkets. The thing we can never forget is most SNAP dollars are spent at large scale supermarkets. That's not going to happen to that. But even if it was happening, it's really hard to do with the EBT system, much harder than it used to be. Okay? The other thing is this comes up again and again, like say, oh, I was at such and such a location where they were selling their SNAP benefits to somebody else, or I was at a store and somebody offered to sell me their SNAP card. I'm like, I don't know where you're going. It's never happened to me. And then I see, but the thing is, is with, it's hard to do this because you'd have to give somebody your card, give them your PIN number, hope they bring it back to you. This whole process, okay? It may have been easier to do when we just had stamps or coupons, but it's not so easy to do now. The other thing is, is that IRS could learn something from SNAP in terms of making sure people get the adequate benefits. The level of error rates in SNAP are far, far below they are for the IRS. Okay? So overall, when people talk about SNAP being this bastion of fraud, I don't, that they're wrong. It's not. It's a very well-run program. Okay? The final misconception is that it leads to increases in obesity. You hear all these people saying, oh, you give SNAP recipients SNAP, and they'll be more likely to be obese than other groups. Okay. On the face of this, this is stupid. Okay. <laughs> Why do we think that if we give people more money that they're going to be put on weight? Okay. Does anybody think Warren Buffett is the biggest man in the country? Nobody thinks that, or nobody thinks we're going to, you know, that's not the way people think. But why do people think that if we give poor persons more money to purchase things, that's going to increase obesity? So in the face of it, it's false for people to say that. And the empirical evidence demonstrates this. The participants are no more likely to be obese than eligible non-participants, and in fact, may be less likely to be obese. There's a paper coming out which shows the more you give money to people in SNAP benefits, the less their probability of obesity. This leads, because people think that SNAP is an obesity promotion program, is that it leads to some really bad policy things that I'm going to come to momentarily. Key threats to SNAP. Okay. First of all, there's block grants. Okay. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. So Paul Ryan had this report that came out talking about um, ways to address poverty in the United States. And I disagree with, I actually agree with about 20% of it. He actually does have some good ideas in it, and I was happy to see him come forward with this. But most of it are bad ideas, and especially bad is block granting SNAP. You want to kill SNAP, you block grant it. Whenever you block grant a program, is funding for that disappears over time, even if in the near term it's good. And one of the amazing things about SNAP is that it increases when demand for that increases. Like it was great. During the Great Recession, Lots of, it wasn't great for people who had the, lost their jobs and stuff, but it was great that we had a program that increases whenever the, there's a bad economy. You block grant that program, that form of it is wrong. And it's especially important that it's not block grant because SNAP is really one of the only remaining, in fact, I think it might be the only remaining uh, assistance programs that's available for people across the age range. I can't, maybe there may be some other ones, whether you're working or not working on other things. So we really have to preserve it. Block grants are, are a bad idea. The other thing is in terms of restrictions. They want to put restrictions on, on who participates. So one example is drug testing. Okay? They want to drug test those who are things. Now, that's just discouraging people from entering the program and I can't imagine that it's really going to induce anybody to say, I'm going to stop using drugs because of this. But also is, is that to some extent, we need to help people who are using drugs and maybe give them SNAP will help them out. But the other thing about that is, there's other people in that household who aren't using drugs, and why are they being punished for this? Okay? So I think drug testing is a bad thing. There's also these work requirements that are being put into place in the main for unemployed ABODs, but like Wisconsin has a pilot program where they want to have uh, households with children six and over is that they have to have to be working. SNAP is not a work encouragement program, okay? It's a hunger relief, it's a hunger, anti-hunger program. So let's not try to overlay these other things on it. Plus, as I noted earlier, it doesn't discourage work, okay? So it doesn't discourage work, so why are we asking it to do something that it's not doing? I mean, if, 
if, if I really believed that staff was discouraging work, I would say that, but it's not. Now for the final one that I'm gonna spend some more time is, and this is where these people from Boston are in favor of these restrictions, is what people wanna rest put restrictions on what people can purchase with SNAP benefits. Just an awful idea, and I'm gonna spend some time talking about that. What are the direct consequences? So you're all familiar with this, you know, the busybodies who are like, like to tell SNAP recipients, here's what you can purchase with SNAP, here's what you can't purchase with SNAP. I don't know why people really think that they can talk to poor people in ways that they would not talk to others. It, it's a huge insult. And so what the consequence of telling people what they can and cannot purchase with SNAP is there'll be an increased stigma. It's really patronizing to tell poor people. Every year I get my mortgage tax deduction. I mean, it's, it's somewhat, I'm not gonna not take my mortgage tax deduction, but it's more than the maximum benefit level for SNAP for a five-person five family. That's crazy. But the government would never dream to tell me how I spend my mortgage tax deduction every year. But we feel that we can tell poor people how they can spend their SNAP benefits. It's patronizing to them, okay? The other thing is, is if you talk to people in the Grocers Association, is it'll increase food prices and reduce the number of SNAP outlets, okay? It's easy for large food stores to incorporate this, but not for smaller ones. What does this all mean? It means that there'll be increased food insecurity in the United States. This is what I always say. If you're pro-restrictions, you're pro-hunger. It'll increase food insecurity because there'll be more stigma, less people want to go on SNAP, higher food prices. It means less people will want to use SNAP and all these other things. That will mean there'll be increased food insecurity. And this whole thing is being done because there's this impression that people are getting SNAP are just bigger, bigger, bigger. That's wrong. And the, the actual case is because SNAP currently is not related, released, related to increases in obesity. And in fact, there's some evidence leads to declines in obesity, is we may find that there's no change in obesity due to these restrictions and perhaps even an increase. Yeah. You said why it would increase food prices? Because on the, on the, the okay, so they have the barcode on all, on all food, and it has certain information about it, like, you know, the size of the product, all, you know, some things, you know, if it's raisins or something, but nothing with the specific information that would provide to say whether or not this is SNAP eligible or SNAP ineligible. So, for example, the, those New Yorkers were saying, okay, well, we're going to ban sugar, we're going to ban Gatorade and all these other things from purchases, okay? Um, the information in the barcode for Gatorade, it doesn't say what percentage of Gatorade is sugar or what percentage uh, is of sugar substitutes or things like that. All the information isn't on there. So what Walmart has said is that, you know, for them, because they have economies of scale, it'll take a lot of time and energy to do this, but they could do it across their system. Small food stores, they would have to do each one independently, things like this. It would take a lot of, of time for this. The other reason why it would increase food prices with respect to this is the good people at FRAC would be putting forth lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit on this. And stores are just going to be like, look, you know, that, that gets brought into this, and there's a lot, lot of problems. The other thing is, is that in terms of increased food prices, is stores have to make a decision. Right, right now, if you go down the aisles, they'll say WIC eligible or WIC, things like this. If we were to do this with SNAP, you'd have to be redesigning the entire snore. store, SNAP eligible or SNAP ineligible, and stores aren't gonna be comfortable labeling some things as SNAP ineligible, because it'll make like, oh, this food is bad because it's SNAP ineligible, but it's for some other reasons. In other words, it's gonna increase food prices. And for us, I mean, for, for, for persons with high enough incomes, food prices don't matter. For low-income households, though, increases in food prices have a big impact. I want to make two more. I, th I think I have a couple more. Two, 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 more, two more points. Okay, two more points. Okay, okay. <laughs> this is something I hate. I do not like to hear. People say, why shouldn't SNAP be more like WIC? Okay, I say, why isn't WIC more like SNAP? And here's the thing about this is that people, WIC is a wonderful program over many dimensions, but there's a lot of things that people don't realize about WIC is participation rates fall steadily from infants, almost all eligible infants in the United States apply. By the time they're four years old, participation is about you know, 15%, hardly any kids. And that's due to a number of reasons, but one of the things is that there's a lot of really big restrictions on this. So I was, I was on this WIC panel with, uh, uh, well, you, well, you know Joe Sharkey, some of you may know Joe Sharkey. Anyway, 
he was talking about how he works in the Rio, Rio Bravo area of, of Texas. And WIC doesn't allow for white rice. They don't allow for brown rice. So a lot of people, they don't eat brown rice in this area. And he's like, well, couldn't you be a little more flexible and let people have white rice? And, but that's not the way, the way Rick works. Um, another funny story about that is I gave a presentation at this WIC conference, the same one Joe was at, and I, and I gave a presentation telling about all the things WIC could learn from SNAP, and it didn't go over well. In fact, the, 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 <laughs> the person speaking after me said, I wish I could have the, half hour of my, the last half hour of my life back. And so that didn't go over well. But the point I'm making here is that SNAP is not like WIC, and we wouldn't want it to be WIC. The other thing is, is WIC is very specific. It says, okay, here's what we think experts think two-year-olds should eat and you can only eat this with WIC, okay? SNAP is for households. Are you really going to design a program where 55-year-olds can eat this, 32-year-olds can eat this, 17-year-olds can eat this, and three-year-olds can eat this all in the same household? That's just silly talk, okay? So when people say that WIC, SNAP should be more like WIC, and I get that all the time, Every time I give a presentation, well, WIC is, I'm like, yeah, yeah, stop there. Anyway, but, I mean, you can say that, though, I mean, you can say that. But the problem is, is WIC may be great at what it does, but it's not an anti-hunger program, and we don't want to change SNAP into WIC, okay? And this is the, I'm going to conclude with this. Beware of experiments. There's all these people who say, well, let's just give it a shot. Let's see what happens if we do this. No. The reason why is because whenever people talk about this is they have some really pedestrian way of looking at the issue. Like, we'll just compare before and after what happened to sugar sweetened beverage consumption. That's a, who cares? Of course it's going to go down. Who really cares that much about, well, it may or may not go down. Actually, we could say ahead of time, it may or may, may, may not go down. But that's not the important question. The important question is how, what happens to food prices? What happens when SNAP, people eligible for SNAP decide not to go in the program because they don't like being patronized? What happens when all these other things, what happens when stores no longer accept SNAP benefits because it's become too expensive? Them? Nobody does this when they talk about these experiments, like when New York said they're going to do this. Okay, and there was, there was an article in New England Journal of Medicine by two of these, you know, at this school here, the Harvard, you know, anyway, saying we should, have, we should do an experiment on this thing. And I also feel like nobody does, people always think it's fine to say to poor people, let's do an experiment on these things. Nobody says that to people like me and said, okay, let's have the college professors, let's randomize their pay and see what they do. Nobody says that. So let's not do that with this case, okay? And when people, it's a backdoor way to get any restrictions in the political place. So I will conclude here, because I really want to listen to Ellen speak and have her a lot more time. Thank you all very much. The people at FRAC, when they heard I was doing this with Craig, and they said, that's a lot of energy in one conference room. <laughs> Actually, Jim said, that's a lot of ego. <laughs> I was like, thank you, Jim. Um, so, we're going to get connected. Um, some of the things um, I can zip through pretty quickly because Craig covered them. Um, I've got a couple of comments to um, respond to some of the things that Craig said. So while we're waiting, just one comment I had. It's funny. You talked about the EBT cards, the Electronic Benefit Transfer Cards. And I've been at FRAC for 30 years. When they first started talking about EBT, FRAC was opposed to it. Pat, you may remember this, because at that time, grocery stores were not accepting credit cards. So we thought there was going to be an EBT-only line, and when the system crashed, our clients didn't have cash, and how are we going to manage this? And it would be another form of stigma. And at the time, Senator Luger Stafford, Dave Johnson, kept saying to me, Ellen, this is going to be the best thing to happen to food stamps, as it was called back then because um, people would swipe their cards. More and more people are going to be using credit cards in grocery stores. And I'm like, really? Um, <laughs> imagine that. And, um, and then, actually, we talked to clients. And they wanted to use a credit card. They wanted to be able to, to swipe it. And of course, at that time, there was um, some trafficking in the paper currency. That's when, in 96, when the welfare reform bill was going through, there was all of this, you know, and that's when the drug um, 
the drug felon ban was introduced as an amendment because people were trafficking in, in food stamps for drugs. Now there's just no connection anymore, but some states still have the bans, so go figure. Um, this was interesting because Craig had the map as well, and what I wanted to show you is this is the map of poverty in the United States, and even though Massachusetts is faring better than most, what I wanted to, to do was to show you the map of food insecurity. If you can have a favorite government statistic, and in Washington people talk about these things, um, the Census Bureau's supplemental poverty measure is my favorite government statistic because poverty measure does not take into account some of our programs. So you often hear people saying the war on poverty failed because there are still people living in poverty. Well, when you use the supplemental poverty measure, it takes into account the earned income tax credit, SNAP, and other public benefits. And when you look at it, SNAP lifted 4.6 million people out of poverty, school lunch 1.25 million people, um, and the refundable tax credits lift 9.1 million Americans out of poverty, and I have the children's statistics. This really shows, in my mind, the impact of our programs. Um, it's 42.7 million as of January. Um, and as Craig mentioned, um, the importance of SNAP, how many people in this country are utilizing the system. The first statistic, 97% of benefits are utilized in the month they are received. People are not hoarding their SNAP benefits. In fact, Walmart and other um, grocers tell us that at 11.50 p.m., the last night of the month, people are lining up at Walmart stores across the country because at 12.01, the new benefit allotments um, get put on the cards. So we know that people are in dire need of these benefits. Um, and we know that for every dollar that the feds put into SNAP benefits, somewhere between $1.74 uh, $1. and $2, um, of local economic activity is generated. And that's why when the Recovery Act was being introduced at the very start of the recession, economists were coming up and saying the biggest bang for the government's buck is investing in SNAP because people go right to the supermarkets in their communities and they spend 97% of their benefits in the month that they are received. Um, and we know that that is a wonderful thing about SNAP. Craig covered this um, about the wonders of SNAP and health. Um, the one thing I would say, and I quoted Debbie Frank this morning, when I talk about SNAP allotments being a sub-therapeutic dose, it inoculates against the symptoms but not the disease. And if we really wanted to get rid of hunger in this country, we would, as Craig said, not talk about the threats to SNAP, but we would be boosting the SNAP allotment. And we know during the Economic Recovery Act, when SNAP benefits universally were boosted across the country, the studies that came out after it showed that people were able to purchase a more nutritionally adequate diet. So rather than restricting what people can buy with their SNAP dollars, if we gave them a more robust allotment, they would be able to go in and buy fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains and protein products. How many people here have taken the SNAP challenge where you try to either live on a SNAP budget or shop on a SNAP budget? It is a really big eye opener. Um, I participated in a, um, a SNAP challenge. There was a group of members of Congress, and we all went to a Safeway in D.C. And it is really amazing watching the members going down the aisles with their cart and trying to figure out how much they've spent. And we get to the cash register, and I remember Joanne Emerson, a congresswoman from Missouri, had to put back a tomato because she was over the amount. And she just said, 
how humiliating. And she said, and how thin a tomato I'm going to have to slice for the week. Uh, Tim Ryan, not Paul Ryan, Tim Ryan, Ohio, um, got his peanut butter jar confiscated by TSA at the airport. And he said, it's going to be jelly sandwiches. So these are the kinds of things that it's good for members of Congress to understand how this works. Um, participation rates, obviously, here in Massachusetts, um, you're doing a much better job of reaching eligible people. And again, as Craig mentioned earlier, some of the, the health outcomes we know um, that SNAP and the Child Nutrition Programs, and I want to talk about them in a minute. Can you go back to the eligibility? So it's at not meaning all those that are eligible were at 95 percent? Or yes. So, wow. And does it differentiate, or do you know what the remainder is like? Is it mostly elders in that 5 percent, or do we know? I, I don't know. Do, do you have an idea? Like, I mean, probably people who are close to the, you know, we know with seniors um, that, that, you know, because they're close. Pat, please. That, that is based on households under 130%. Instead of poverty, not, oh, you're right, that makes more sense. Thank you. Because if you broad base Cat L, that doesn't, yeah. Poverty. And this is based on 130 percent. Yeah, got it. Got it. Thank you. That that makes a lot more sense. And that makes a lot more sense. Um, just leaving SNAP for a second, I go around the country, and people want to know what's happening in Washington. And the, what used to be the first question I got asked is, we know last year you were supposed to reauthorize the child nutrition programs. That didn't happen. Is Congress going to reauthorize the child nutrition programs this year? The committees that have jurisdiction, and there's a farm bill primer out there, um, for the farm bill, which covers SNAP and TFAP, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, and the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, those are dealt with in the farm bill, and the House and Senate Agriculture Committees have jurisdiction over those programs. Well, the Senate Agriculture Committee was also the committee that was dealing with the child nutrition programs. They can't deal with both huge bills at the same time. So we are not going to see child nutrition reauthorization dealt with this year while they're doing the farm bill. So unfortunately, there were some pretty positive provisions that we had been working on for a long time, for instance, um, there was bills that were dropped that would have allowed children who were in child care for more than eight hours a day to get an additional snack or meal. Um, common sense. Little bodies, little meals throughout the course of the day. Um, there was a bill to provide for a seamless transition from after school meal programs to summer meal programs through one continuous program year round. Um, that was in there. Uh, we had worked really hard with Feeding America and the after school providers on that. You probably heard in um, the president's skinny, emaciated, anorexic budget, um, <laughs> there was a proposal to stop funding after school meal programs, not pro meal programs, after school programming. Well, that's where our after school meals are occurring. And in the summertime, kids are getting their summer meals, oftentimes at summer programs, where they're getting either educational enrichment or physical activities or parks and recs or boys and girls clubs. You know the drill. Um, so we weighed in very heavily with our after school partners um, to try to um, weigh in heavily against those cuts. The big I think for me, in my lifetime at FRAC, you know, you see the emergence of the after-school snack program, then we saw the after-school meal programs. Um, now there is enormous attention on breakfast. And I remember when I first came to FRAC, we were trying to get schools to offer breakfast programs. Then it was schools were offering them, but kids weren't participating. 
and it was some very smart people who figured out that the poor kids were in the cafeteria and no middle or high school kid wanted to be that kid in the cafeteria in the, in the morning. So they started doing breakfast after the bell and al alternative delivery systems. So um, my children went to a very enlightened elementary school where on testing day, they served breakfast. Not the other days of the year. They just, the PTA sponsored breakfast only on testing day. Um, but now schools across the country are offering breakfast after the bell. Kids are getting br universal breakfast in homeroom. Uh, they have kiosks where it's grab and go. The kids are eating their breakfast. They're throwing the trash out. The custodial staff are supporting it. The principals are embracing it. And that was critical when we got the American Association of School Administrators to join us. Why? Because they saw test scores going up. And that's what motivated them, was the test scores. Then the school nurses came in and said, you know, the kids aren't coming in early in the morning with stomach aches and pains. And then the assistant principals came in and said, we have less behavioral problems now. All because the kids were getting breakfast. And that's what they go back to. So um, it really is an incredible thing. So I just wanted to sort of introduce that. Um, the senior programs, um, you probably heard that in the skinny emaciated budget, Meals on Wheels was also under attack. Um, so we came in in support of that. And then these are the other senior programs. But this is what I wanted to talk about. Craig talked about what he would like to talk about. This is what I would love to talk about, how we're really going to end hunger in this country. Um, and, and we all know that it starts with jobs. It, it just, and then housing, and then childcare, and all the things that would end hunger in this country. But unfortunately, this year, we are talking about building the political will to stop the cuts. I mentioned the Farm Bill, because if you were to ask me, what is the big anti-hunger issue that people are talking about now in Washington, it's snap, snap, snap. And SNAP gets reauthorized, which means literally that Congress opens the books on the laws that govern the SNAP program and looks at ways to change, improve, um, streamline, expedite, however you want to say it, the program. And these are the committees with jurisdiction, as I mentioned before. And um, Jim McGovern from Worcester, um, I always love saying Worcester because my daughter, when she was in college, got a fake ID and she went to show it to me and she said, I got one from Worcester, Massachusetts. And I'm like, you better not tell the bouncer that, honey. Um, so um, Jim McGovern is our ranking subcommittee member on the House Ag Committee. And we were talking earlier about there's just so much noise and so many distractions in Washington. Jim McGovern is the most focused member of Congress. Every week he goes to the floor of Congress and talks about hunger. He spends his life educating other members of the Ag Committee. Um, he is the best champion we could have ever hoped for. And you've got him in your own backyard. So um, thank you for sharing him with the rest of the country. Um, they've already started, there are, have been 20 hearings in the House Ag Committee just on SNAP. They want to do a top to bottom review of the SNAP program, which should worry the heck out of all of us. Because where, where is this all going? Didn't they just do that? Didn't they just they completed 20 yeah. hearings. Yeah. I thought they just completed their review. Well, yeah, and it was 20 hearings was okay. the course of their review. But then they still had a hearing a couple of weeks ago. So they're going to continue. I mean, they're not done yet. Um, but there, there was a, uh, a hearing, a field hearing in, in Kansas, because Pat Roberts is from Kansas. And Debbie Stabenow is from Michigan. So we're going to have um, another Senate Ag Committee hearing um, on that. So Craig covered this, but I want to this I want to delve into more because the biggest threat to the SNAP program is structure. And 
yes, people, we know it as block grants, or we like to say block cuts, um, but they may not call it a block grant, but it's a structural change. So Paul Ryan calls it an opportunity grant, but it's the same sad, pathetic block grant. Um, and what they're going to say is the federal government doesn't know what your community knows best. So what we want to do is give the states a set amount of money and let them operate their own programs. Now, for some people, that would seem very attractive. But for the fact, as Craig mentioned before, we are federal and quote unquote entitlement programs, which means that if you are, are income eligible and you hit all the eligibility requirements, you get the benefits, much like Social Security. There are only a few programs in the federal government that still operate this way. Think aid to families with dependent children. The, now the TANF program. And if you look at the participation in TANF, it, it's like, it goes like this, because it was block granted in 96. So think about what would have happened during the recession if SNAP would have been block granted. Massachusetts would have gotten a certain amount of money. Once they utilized that pot of money, there's no money coming in. So you would have to either cut benefits or start waiting lists. Think natural disasters. Katrina, people left New Orleans and they went to Houston and Memphis and other parts of the country. Houston absorbed all these people coming in. They, their SNAP outreach, their SNAP participation grew. Had Texas gotten a block grant, Houston would have had a problem they would have had to stop taking applications, waiting lists, or cut benefits. Think child nutrition programs, no nutrition standards, no, um, you know, no requirements. When last year, when the House Education Committee was looking at ways to block grant the child nutrition programs, they said, eh, you only have to have, we're gonna do three states and let them opt into a block grant, but they would only have to operate one meal. That would be the requirement. No nutrition standards would give you a certain amount of money, and you could run your own program. And so all 50 states would have different requirements for the child nutrition programs because they do have nutrition standards. Um, it would have been an absolute mess. And so we are petrified of any structural changes, any opt, you know, making it an option to block grant um, a program. So um, that is huge for us. So no structural changes. And again, we've learned from the TANF example. So what can we do? And a lot of you will say, well, Ellen, we're in Massachusetts. Our members of Congress are very supportive. Like, what else c could we do? Um, and what we often say is um, relentless advocacy. Um, all of your members need to be champions. They can't just point to Jim McGovern and say, Jim will take care of us. And for those of you who were at the Frack Feeding America conference in Washington, you heard from Pat Roberts, who's the chair of the Ag Committee. And, and he said, you know, I oppose block grants and I'm the chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee. But you can't always think of me as the backstop for every bad idea that's coming over from the House. You all have to, got to go to the House and work to get me the best worst bill that they could get out. And oftentimes that's what we do. We just work to make a bad bill better so that there's less negotiating space between what the Senate puts out and what the House puts out. So we've, we've got to work on getting the best bill possible. Um, and it's relentless advocacy. And what I love about this chart from the Congressional Management Institute is, you know, it talks about when you hear from directly from constituents, and then down here is when you've got like a paid lobbyist like me, which is why I love going on Hill visits with you all. Best way to educate your members, site visit, site visit, site visit. And 
our members of Congress, even the best of them, don't get the opportunity to interact with our clients. So any way that you can get a client to sit down and talk to a member of Congress is a really good deal. And let me just give you an example. Saxby Chambliss from Georgia, chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee. We were doing a farm bill. Um, Sherrod Brown from Ohio said, in addition to the speaker from the General Accounting Office and the Food and Nutrition Service and the you know, Congressional Budget Office, I want a real person testifying before the Senate Agriculture Committee. And Saxby Chambliss from Georgia said, fine, get a client, knock yourself out. So we work with folks in Ohio and we get a woman who's on SNAP to testify. Her 10-year-old son is in the big Senate Ag Committee hearing room. So she's talking and she says, well, you know, I'm very lucky because my boss lets me go to the food stamp office when I need to, to, you know, go back and recertify or to acknowledge changes in my circumstances. She says, of course, I don't get paid when I go, but he, he's not firing me. I still have a job. So then she's you know, going through her testimony and she said, you know, one day I'd love to save up money for my son's college education. I'd love to send my son to college. He'd be the first in our family. Saxby Chambliss interrupts her and said, excuse me, you, you're telling me if you have a separate college fund for your son, that would preclude you from being on SNAP? And she said, oh yeah, it would count against me because um, it, it would be a resource that I would have and I, I wouldn't be able to get SNAP. And she said, so I've got to make a decision now whether I'm going to give him SNAP benefits or save for college and I choose to feed him today. And um, just pretty obvious. Um, two weeks later, this conservative Republican from Georgia who was chair of the Agriculture Committee drops a bill to exclude college savings accounts and retirement accounts from counting for your SNAP resources. It made it in the final bill. So I love this story because A, I was there and it was like electric. Um, but two, one woman's story touched a senator. What she did not know, Chambliss's wife and daughter are educators. And in his mind, the way out of poverty is through education. That was the most important thing she could have ever said to that man. So I love when you work with clients and you get them in front of members of Congress. Um, you can't come to Washington. They're in their district offices a lot. Make an appointment. What we love to say, and Rosa DeLora was just on a call, um, which reminds me, the recent New England Journal was Yale, not Harvard. Um, <laughs> just saying. Um, Rosa Delora. Oh, she was on a call with us recently. And hello. Woo, did you see that go? Um, she said if six to eight organizations in her state or district request a meeting with her when she's home, there's a 100% chance they'll get it. So we keep telling people during the recesses, and they're on recess this week, but they're back in recess in May and then all summer long, find six, seven, eight other organizations in your community. Um, I always suggest getting someone from a religious group, someone from an educational group, someone from a health and nutrition group, someone from a senior group, just put together you know, your diverse coalition of organizations, agree on an ask, agree that no one's gonna take you off message, and go in and say, our message is you've gotta speak out loudly in caucus and on the floor in support of SNAP, and these are the three reasons why in our district it's so important, and these are things you need to know. Um, you know, paper plate campaigns, the SNAP challenge. Um, do you tweet with your member of Congress? It's on their website or their Twitter handles. Um, it is remarkable to me if I am watching the floor and I tweet out a member, how quickly I get a response. Um, they are monitoring their social media big times. Um, this is a picture of George Miller. He was a member from California. He's at a summer food site. 
Um, we really want to get members into SNAP offices. I was in Detroit on a, in a, at a call center, and Debbie Stabenow was listening in on some of the calls that came through on the hotline after getting permission from the caller to, that others would be listening. Um, it's an incredible way for members of Congress to hear some of the stressors that are um, occurring with their members. The only other thing I just wanted to leave you with is our federal nutrition programs work. Not only do they work, but they work really well and they work exactly the way they were intended to work. When the economy is strong, they contract. When the economy is weak, they expand. This elasticity allows our programs to serve families in need. We did not have to build supermarkets, roadside stands, farmers markets, CSAs. They were there. We just give people the resources to go into those various food retail outlets and buy nutritionally adequate foods based on their culture, based on their food preference, their dietary restrictions, whatever. We give adults the ability to go in and purchase for their households. And that's why we, we do support allowing families to continue to do that. Um, so I'm going to stop now, and then we can Let's first say thank you. handle your questions. Oh. OK. I don't even think we need these. OK. So we do have uh, plenty of time for questions. Good. And I've got 100 myself. But, uh, but please, let's uh, open it up to your questions. So Andrew, maybe share with us who you are. I know this is Andrew here from Rhode Island. Andrew Schiff from the Rhode Island Community Food Bank. Ellen, can you talk about the federal budget process and timeline for the rest of this year? Sure. Um, so I kept alluding to the president's skinny budget. Um, right now, if you recall, we have not passed the budget for this current fiscal year, which is 17. So right now, we're working under what's called a CR, a continuing resolution. So programs are continuing, and the government hasn't shut down. The current CR runs out the end of next week, on the 28th. Um, and that's Congress comes back next Monday. So they literally have a week to finish the current year's budget. And as you know, if they don't pass a budget by the 28th and they don't extend that CR, the government shuts down. So I think there's a 0% chance the government is going to shut down. There's just, they're not going to do that in the first year of a new Congress. So what will happen is they'll probably need another week to work out the kinks. They've agreed on the four squares of the budget. Um, the dollar amounts, um, they're not going to build the wall, they're not going to give defense the big increases the president asked for, um, they're going to keep programs funded pretty much where they are. The big issue holding it up are what's known as the policy riders, and that is um, people with very strong um, ideological beliefs want to insert a rider. So for instance, defunding Planned Parenthood is a rider you hear about a lot. Um, and so they have to work through those. And the leadership has agreed we're not going to do riders. We're just going to get 2017 done so that we can start on 2018. Um, and that's where I think the real danger is. Because in 2018, that's going to be the president's first real budget. And he's going to want to put his mark on that. His more detailed budget is due out the end of May. So although there were no proposals in the skinny budget to the entitlement programs, like SNAP, school meals, things like that, that will be coming out in late May. So we need to be vigilant on what some of those could be. He could. He could put block grants in there. He could um, assume there's going to be something about uh, weakening the nutrition standards for school meals will be in there. Um, 
you know, some of the things don't have a budget impact, like restric restricting SNAP choice won't have a savings. So for those who will want to squeeze these programs, that's not enough pound of flesh. What scares me is when people talk about these proposals to restrict what you can buy with choice. I'm a member of Congress, and I say, well, I think that 6% of SNAP purchases are for soda. So I'm going to say you can't buy soda with SNAP, and I'm going to cut your allotment by 5%. Win, win. That's the environment we're in now. It's all about pulling savings out of these programs. I hate that. They're cuts. They're not savings. They're cutting our programs. So that's why this is the worst environment for all the reasons Craig said and more that we shouldn't be talking about SNAP choice. Go ahead. Do you have a, a comment to that as well? Okay. Say yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Fascinating. Please. Yeah, tell, tell us who you are. Uh, Lindsay Haight from Our Neighbor's Table. Uh, we're up on the North Shore. Is there a partnership with you know, the retailers in the grocery industry talking about the double, doubling the money back to the economy and if, you know, people receiving SNAP are already the bad guys, so let's just assume nobody cares about them. So at least we can talk about the damage to the local economies when you take that benefit out of the economy. Is there, is there, is there an active partnership in the lobbying and, and saying we're fighting the same fight with Walmart and grocery store chains and... Yeah, they think... Um, Yes, the answer is yes. Um, the retail industry, the medical community, there are others that talk about, you know, the benefits of these programs to the economy. Um, so yes, but they, they think it's, they're stronger going into those meetings on their own and through their industry rather than necessarily always going in with us. There is a coalition that works together on the SNAP choice issue, um, but I think just as you're talking about in general, the economic, you know, benefits of SNAP to communities will work with um, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National Conference of State Legislators, because they are the ones that see the benefits in these communities. So local governments and municipalities are really important. So um, one of the things that I'm working on when I get back to Washington is getting um, some of these partners, as you're identifying, to send letters and for local um, state, state and local governments to pass resolutions that support SNAP for these reasons. So for example, the first week in February, Michigan and me is in Alaska, working with the advocates there, and we got the governor of Alaska to write a letter in support of SNAP. We've got the Speaker of the House getting a resolution through the Alaska legislature talking about why SNAP is important in their state. Because they're, they're, they're still in a recession right now. So that's what they put in their resolution. We need state and local governments across the country talking about why SNAP is important in our community, in our backyard, because we're unique. And that kind of puts a wall against this notion that state and local governments want block grants. They don't want block grants, because these, you know, these folks know what it means. Yeah, the only other thing I would add to that is some of these organizations, they're maybe a little, somewhat reluctant, even though they're supportive of SNAP, to say to public. I mean, you should correct me if I'm wrong. For example, one out of every three SNAP dollars is spent at Walmart, which is great. I mean, low prices, safe, affordable food and everything, so that's great. But on the other hand, if they speak too strongly in favor of it, it'll seem self-serving, and so that's... So I think under the rib. The other thing is about this, about the amount of money coming back to communities. Communities always want to have, you know, a new DMV office or a new, you know, new uh, army base or something. And so SNAP serves a similar role. You're bringing outside money into the community. So. Yeah. And that's why I love the farmers markets and other things because people love seeing folks going to farmers markets. And it's such a direct support of the local farm community. 
and also it's fresh fruits and vegetables and I love shopping at farmers markets I just you know and I just think it's a really great place to bring your kids and have them experiment with fruits and vegetables and stuff so we do have a great delegation for sure um, we also have a Republican governor so uh, and you mentioned the governor of Alaska weighing in on in uh, with Congress in that state uh, what's your recommendation for getting Governor Baker to weigh in and with whom okay the NGA the National Governors Association it is re and what the governor from Alaska did is he not only sent his letter to the Alaska congressional delegation and the White House, it also went to the National Governors Association because they come out with recommendations and they needed to hear that one of their own is saying no. And so if you were able to get your governor to write a letter to the administration and the Secretary of Agriculture, and Sonny Perdue's um, vote is on the 24th, um, and he's likely to be um, our next Secretary of Agriculture, he's from Georgia, um, sending it to Purdue and the NGA, um, that would be an incredible thing. And you could always get your, your congressional delegation and others to urge him to do that. So that would be an incredibly powerful thing to do. Have a question? Sure, please. Tell us who you are. Hi. We, um, we missed that with Pat Baker from oh, Florida. So that's okay. We, we know who you are, but <laughs> And I've worked with Pat just about as long as I've worked with Catherine. Um, I'm Stephanie Tyler. I'm from Beverly Bootstraps Community Services up on the North Shore also. Um, is there anything, like not restrictions, but is there anything that SNAP can do to increase or encourage nutritional, like better nutritional choices for the recipients? Or the do you think that's it. more of like the role? <laughs> I don't know, some, something else. Great point. So, so I think that, so the countervailing thing to, to restrict is, is to say let's incentivize. And actually I, th I think it was in Massachusetts, right? Healthy incentive pilot was in Massachusetts to Josh say, Schumacher. and so to give people the ability to basically if you buy pound of apples you're paying half as much as you would if you're using SNAP benefits. I think those things are great. I mean, just so long as they don't cut it by. I mean, that's always my concern is that, but anyway, I think, I think that's great. I also think we shouldn't overlook the importance of, of, of education, and people like SNAP-Ed. SNAP-Ed is really uh, a great thing. There's a lot of studies that have shown that it can have a lot of benefits in terms of encouraging these quote-unquote healthy purchases. But one thing that I do want to um, I'm in complete agreement that we, we sh that things like this could be done. But I think I, we should never forget, though, that SNAP is not doing a bad job at this. I think sometimes, I'm mean, all in favor of these double up things and stuff like that. But I think we should also recognize that if you compare SNAP recipients to eligible non-recipients, is over almost every dimension is that they're, they, they, do, they, they do better. And, and yeah. And the other thing about it is, like, that's why this New York Times story was so damaging. Um, maybe some of you saw it at the front, you know, that was just awful. It was, well, first of all, it was misleading. Well, it was, the report itself was misleading, but is that it was misleading for a number of reasons. So, well, I think that we should, whenever I talk about it, I think we should say, okay, these things are great ways to improve SNAP, but SNAP's already great. That's, I'm, I, I couldn't agree more. And the other thing is, is that as a, society we all could do better with our eating habits and one of the most exciting things about the new nutrition standards for the child nutrition programs is you've got new guidelines for kids in preschool um, settings and whether they're in Head Start or uh, family child care homes or centers they're eating more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and then they're going into the elementary schools and they're eating more healthier foods and as they move up into the middle and high schools we're seeing a, a whole different environment in school cafeterias and you know I don't know about you but my kids often introduce new foods to me because they're all watching the cooking channels and they're they're cooking from scratch they it's an art form, they love it. And they're teaching us to eat healthier so we can all do better with nutrition ed and, and things like that. But 
whenever, and, and I keep thinking about, um, again, going back to Rosa DeLauro, I've sat in so many hearings when they talk about drug testing or finger printing SNAP recipients, her attitude is, yeah, you'll do that when everyone who gets a farm subsidy gets drug tested or finger imaged. And, and you know, she's talked about dropping a bill requiring that if you're going to test one, you know, you have to drug test everybody who gets a government benefit, including those who get mortgage deductions. <laughs> well, to, what's the percentage of every USDA dollar? It used to be like 60 cents on that dollar was an FNS food nutrition and 40 cents was a uh, government subsidy. Is it still that? Has it changed? We're 80, 80%. 80 percent of the USDA budget is food and nutrition. Okay, and that and 20 percent is the subsidy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that's that's good. That's been a big change. Yeah. I just wanted to say one more thing about this issue about, you know, we're talking about asking farmers. I mean, I think whenever somebody says, whenever he says we should do such and such in terms of what poor people get or can or can't do, I always ask myself, would I want somebody to say that to me? And do that to me. And if if if, I, if the answer is no, I wouldn't want that to, done to me. Then my response is, I don't want that done to somebody else. And that so I think we really have to really be. That's why I. There's a very visceral re reaction to restrictions on SNAP. The questions. Yeah. Are there any particular states where like they're kind of in the middle? You know, like if we have a friend called them in. Georgia because they're susceptible to being swayed. I, I, I think I might have it with me. I have a target list that I walk around <laughs> with because <laughs> there's like always people. Um, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey have a really great density of what we call mods. Um, of course, over time, the continuum has shifted a little to the right. But there are people we go to. So right after the election, I went with the Alaskans to go visit Lisa Murkowski um, from Alaska. She thinks block granting is a really bad idea. And she will get up and talk about how she thinks block granting is a really bad idea. She's also one of the few members that talk about defunding Planned Parenthood and other things. Women senators, they are the hope for the future. And we, no, seriously, we were talking about this at lunch. Um, unbeknownst to the general public, years ago, there were a group of women senators who said, you know, this partisan riff, this nastiness, this in, you know, uncivil talk has got to stop. And the shortened work week, which I agree, has created this dynamic. Um, members of Congress, their kids used to be on soccer teams together, they would do picnics together. They're, they are from Tuesday to Thursday night and then they fly home. There's no grounding in their relationships. There's no trust. So the women senators years ago said, we're going to invite every female senator, and there's more of them now, um, to join our group. We're not talking business. We're just getting to know one another. So every month they get together and they celebrate life cycles. Um, a senator can propose an activity. So a couple months ago, um, I think it was uh, Feinstein likes bowling, whoever knew. And so they all went bowling together and ate, you know, at the bowling league. And they had a blast. When the government shut down last time, it was a little story, but it was the women senators who went to Mitch McConnell and said, here's our proposal. Patty Murray took the lead on it. She then went to Paul Ryan, and that's how they broke the logjam. Interesting. So good question about how we help others because of our delegation. So you've got Elizabeth Warren, who's actively involved with the, that, those women senators, and they talk all the time. So um, I would definitely encourage that behavior. Other questions? Is um, is Mr. Perdue a, a friend, a foe? Do we know as a, as the Secretary of Agriculture? Do we sort of a blank slate on our issue? Um, okay. I watched the whole confirmation hearing, and the word "snap" was mentioned once in passing by um, Senator Gillibrand. Um, never came up. 
So you've are, seen more of ag? Is it totally ag? And is it true that the Midwestern folks are worried because there's a Georgian running ag now versus the folks in the middle, which are the, the subsidy farmers? Right. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, there is I, in the main. I know that the like American Soybean Association has supported Purdue, so I think it's, I think it's fine. And um, I, um, you know, I, I will say just, I just want, did want to make a comment about that. There seems to be almost no interest. So it's funny. Is is for my work, I work with farmers a lot, but I also work good nutrition and public health. Whenever you have debate discussions about the farm bill, it's like there's two completely different discussions and they don't meet at all. So I really hope, that, I think there are ways to reach out to farmers because there, are, while farmers and other groups, there are some areas where they don't overlap. There are a lot of ways where we do overlap in terms of like farmers do care about food security maybe in different ways than other groups do but they all talk a lot about we're feeding the world that's what we do on our corn and bean farms or as another example is farmers are really supportive of free trade that's and free trade helps out our uh, keep fo food prices low in terms of, a lot of things so there's, or if you think about the the grocery industry in terms of working with them in terms of you know snap benefits them and, and some of these other things so anyway there's lots of areas where i think we could talk more about trying to reach across and do stuff you know with them i think the one thing that um is true with the farm bill is that it's it's one of the strangest pieces of legislation in the congress and um in order to get the urban vote for the farm bill, you have to bring along the nutrition programs. So there's this love-hate kind of a thing where they know if you try to separate, and which Congress has tried to do in the past, the nutrition programs from the agricultural, traditional ag programs, the bill won't pass. So they know they have to work together. So um, we do meet with our colleagues in conservation, in agriculture, and in the farm industry um, to work together to put forward a comprehensive farm bill. And I think what was learned from prior years is that one cannot throw the other under the bus, that there is that symbiotic relationship and that they need each other. Um, to get it passed. So I have a couple questions. One from the research side on the on the meal gap. Are we making progress? So I mean, I think just at the national level. I, so I, I want to emphasize is that yes, it's great that food insecurity rates are falling, but I still really want to emphasize that while we're making progress over that dimension is. Out of those who are still in need, is there's an increase in need amongst them. That's why I do, I, well, I do, well, I am happy that we look at binary measures, food insecure, food secure. There's a lot more going on that I think we need to talk about. I think that there is a lot, you know, a lot of, coming back to the fact that food insecurity rates stayed steady from 2009 to 2014, despite the end of the Great Recession. We also have to talk about how even those who in some sense aren't getting out of this, I think they're probably worse off than they were before the great, I mean, there's a lot of people who are being left behind in this expansion, and a lot of them are quite poor, and a lot of them are really suffering from even deeper levels of food insecurity. So while yes, I think we're making progress, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done, and you, you, people are going to get tired of me always saying this, but this is where SNAP really enters in. It's really, if you want to have a, sh I, I'm in complete agreement, we've got to, you know, raise employment levels, raise wages, all these other things are important. But if you want to do something here and today, is the most effective way to is, is get more people on SNAP and give them more money on, through SNAP. That's, I can't think of a more effective way to reduce food insecurity in our country. So in other words, is yes, we're making progress. We can make more progress by using SNAP. And be careful about participation rates. Yeah. Uh, we, we talk about it's great, the economy's getting better, and SNAP participation is going down. We also know that SNAP participation is going down because more and more states are not taking up options. And the time limits um, that are imposed on childless adults looking for work um, are not coming up as, as often. And so we know those people are losing access to SNAP. And there's no other government benefit that they're probably going to get. So, I worry about that. I worry about WIC participation numbers going down. Yes, I know that the 
you know, the, the sort of pregnancy rates are going down in this country, but I am also worried that we're not reaching enough of those households. And one thing that has not come up yet in our conversation, I talk about threats to SNAP and I talk about structural changes, I talk about death by a thousand cuts, you know, whether they want to, you know, cut here or there or there. The tsunami coming broadside is immigration reform. Yeah. And we hear stories in WIC clinics where moms are coming back and saying, I don't want these WIC benefits because they're afraid years down the line they're going to be deemed a public charge. And we're hearing it in schools where parents don't want their kids enrolled in free school meals because they're worried that they're going to be, they're eligible now, but they're afraid in, in next year with this administration, they could be deemed a public charge and it could be a deportable offense. I, I wanted to make one quick comment about these eligibility things. What, what, what Ellen put up there was the, was the official rate. There's a lot of debate about whether or not that's accurately measuring what's going on. Um, some people say they're, they're quite a bit lower than that. Depends upon how you define eligibility and the, well, to get, technical for two sentences. The numerator is defined by the number of people on SNAP. The denominator is defined by the people who are seemingly eligible for SNAP. You get too many people in the numerator compared to what should be in the denominator. There's a, that's, I, I don't even know why I even mentioned all this. But anyway, the point being is it's too high. And the other thing is, is for what Ellen just mentioned, is if all of a sudden ABODs are real ineligible, then eligibility, I mean, this is the same thing that happens to the unemployment rate. You know, participation rates will go up, but that's just because you're kicking people off the program. And so we have to be really careful of some of these things when, when, when we're talking about it, and especially in states. You know, it's fantastic that Massachusetts has 200% of the thing, but you get some crazy things. Like you have a lot of people, I, I'm not sure how they're counting people at 190% of the poverty who are, you know, eligible for SNAP but not getting any benefits, I'm not sure if they're considered a participant. I don't think they, I don't know. I don't, think they I don't know. And remember, when they talk about um, childless workers, they're, they're not talking about work requirements. They're talking about time limiting people on the program. They, you know, work requirements is another issue. And, you know, there are so many ways that Congress could chip away yeah. at our eligibility, whether it's drug testing, finger imaging, work, um, you know, and, and, knock, and, and getting rid of some uh, state options. You know, we have to be vigilant in defending against all of these different things. I remember once in a hearing in the Education Committee, and um, one member said, well, and you, you raised it before, made me think of it, um, the shame factor. And they said, you know, this one member said, I actually think that there's no harm in having a child, you know, cleaning erasers or sweeping the cafeteria floor in order to pay arrears in their school meals. <laughs> and I remember Delora was on the committee and she just looked at him. And it was Jack Kingston, that's who it was, who was a surrogate for the Trump administration from, jo from Savannah, Georgia. And she said, don't you think being poor is a burden enough for these children? Um, so again, you know, I just, I worry about this idea of reintroducing stigma. New Mexico just passed a law, and some of you may have read about it, there were, stories across the country where families whose kids were on reduced price meals where you have to put the 30 cents or the 40 cents for breakfast or lunch they were in arrears and the kids were being given cheese sandwiches um, or the meals were taken off the kids trays and thrown out because their families were in arrears and New Mexico passed a law saying you can't do that and now um, there's an effort to make that federal so we're, you know, again, having to take the stigma out of school meals. It's like our kids don't have enough stressors in their life. They have, they, they know what kind of sneakers each one is wearing, let alone having to be, you know, portrayed as a poor kid. You know, we're sort of at our end of our time. And so you, oh, you, you, you have another comment? Could I just make one quick comment? I, the other problem that I have with singling out these, you know, able-bodied adults without dependents is a lot of these persons have, 
just because the children aren't in their household, they're paying child support and things like this, or they may be caring for their parents in some way, plus they're members of our community. So I really feel that like to single them out as though there's some, you know, it, it is, is really wrong. And I, we're out of time now, but I think there's some potential, there's some unintended consequences from this is that a lot of people who are um, able-bodied adults without dependents, a lot of them struggle to find work for a number of different reasons. In other contexts, they could be considered disabled. And I think a lot of, rightfully so, a lot of people will say, look, if I have to go to work, and the only reason I get, and I, I'd like to get SNAP, but I can't, but if I declare that I'm, if I go in for SSI, and I may be, hopefully they'll get benefits from that if they can't get on the SNAP, but then they're eligible or something like this. I think we need to be really careful about some of these unintended consequences, and actually pr imposing these work requirements may actually make more people exit the workforce be for these reasons. And so I really want to say, and back to what I said earlier was, SNAP doesn't discourage work. So in other words, if that's the premise of the whole thing of requiring people to work, it's just backwards. Well, and of course, they never throw out money for job training or exactly. job search. Yeah. Right. There's no support for trying to get these folks yeah. to work. It's just a requirement, and if you don't meet it, you're off. Right. So what we've learned today is that it's uncertainty. It's big changes coming, lots of threats to change, and chasing down the threat before the threat somehow disappears somewhere. I think your point about immigration, and, and I know uh, Mass Law Reform is doing a lot of work on this, is a, is a sleeper for sure. Um, many of the folks in this room that provide food, and the food bank has uh, a, a supplier of the food that's given out, are fearful of that increased demand, right, coming to their doors, because as people leave the, the formal systems for fear or concern, uh, they're going to go into private systems. So. Leave us with a comment of hope here, <laughs> because in essence, we know that it's going to be a challenging time. And we have a great system in Massachusetts, and we welcome Rhode Island and the New England food banks and the others that are here that work pretty well together. But these are difficult times coming. So how, what do you see that can help us be, remain hopeful? I am an extraordinarily hopeful person. <laughs> This is not our first rodeo. We have been here before where there have been attacks on our programs. There's, all I can tell you in Washington, there's so much noise. Every week it's like another issue. And so what I think is important, and your, your last comment is like so incredibly important, it is so important for us to raise the level of advocacy to the point where you folks have an incredibly special message. You are the people who are picking up the pieces where the safety net is not perhaps working optimally. And so what you have to say is, we are on th full throttle already. And if you cut these programs, we cannot pick up the slack. And I, and I love when the head of Catholic Charities you know, said, we used to be in the business of transforming lives. We did job training, we did you know, substance abuse, we did all these things to help people move ahead in life. We are now just getting meals out. And we, we're not even doing that um, to the level of need. If you put more on us, these peop there'll be starvation in the streets. There's no other way to say that. I'm, op I'm, I'm optimistic because of the good people at FRAC and the good people at Great, Greater Boston Food Bank. I mean, I really mean that, is that really have been at the forefront of advocating for all this, and so I'm optimistic as long as you guys are around that things will, things will turn out fine. And, and, and overall, we, you know, people do want to help others, so hopefully it will, it will work out for the best. Good. So thank, thank you. you both again.